All right, now let's turn to the other type of, of nuclear energy mechanism, and that is fusion. Fusion. You know, again, uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, binding energy as a function of the, of the uh, mass of the atomic, of, of, of the nuclides, lighter ones and heavier ones are relatively unstable compared to the intermediate ones, so we can fuse the heavier ones together. I'm sorry, fuse lighter ones together called fusion or split heavier ones. And because the shape of the curve, splitting heavier ones do not release as much energy as, as fusing lighter ones per nucleon. So fusion is more energy efficient than fission. Fusion has some very basic difference from fission. And immediately you know that in order to fuse lighter nu nuclei together, you have to first overcome their coolant repulsion. Every nucleus is positively charged because of the protons. And uh, when you get them very close together, they're going to start to repel each other by coolant repulsion. And unless you get them close enough so that a strong nuclear force can take over before that point, coolant force remains the only significant force, so they repel each other. And you have to overcome their repulsion to get them close enough so that strong nuclear force, which is attractive, takes over and fusion takes place. So the primary thing here is how do you get them that close? If you want to get, get them that close, you have to give them enough energy, the nucleons, uh, you have to get the nuclei enough energy so they can get close together to overcome the coolant potential barrier. So you have to give them a lot of kinetic energy. And with a, such a high kinetic energy per, per nucleus, you're looking at an extremely high temperature. So that is the primary feature of fusion. You have to give them enough temperature for them to get close enough together. The temperature, we're talking about at least 10 million Kelvin, 10 million Kelvin. And in some cases, you have to go beyond 10 million Kelvin, depending on what kind of fusion we're looking at. Okay, so that is the primary thing that we have to think about for fusion. How do you sustain this, this kind of temp high temperature? Now, there are fusion going on in, in a nature, and there are also artificially induced fusion. And when it comes to fusion in nature, the most important example is what's going on in the sun. Our sun has a surface temperature of only 5,800 Kelvin. That corresponds to a black body whose primary radiation is, is in, in, in visible light. And not only so, it's the yellow color of visible light. But the interior of the sun is a very different story. The sun is, is very massive, and it's got a huge amount of gravitational pull. So near the sun, uh, at, at, the uh, at the center of the sun, the gravitational pull uh, causes a very high concentration of, uh, of protons, primary protons. And they're so close together, and they move it very, high, very fast. The core temperature of the sun is about 15 million Kelvin, 1.5 times to the 7 Kelvin. And that is enough to sustain nuclear fusion. The so-called proton-proton cycle, that is the most famous cy uh, reaction sequence, nuclear reaction sequence, for with which the sun produces its energy. So the sun basically is a, is a huge nuclear furnace, producing energy through nuclear fusion, not fission. So what is the proton-proton cycle? You start with proton, you end up with proton. That's, that's, that's called proton-proton cycle. Two protons, when they get very close together, they can fuse together to produce a deuterium, which has new, one neutron and one proton. Of course, you have two E, you only have one E, right? So you have to release an extra positron, plus an anti-electron neutrino. This is the energy that comes out of it. Okay, and then the next step, now that you have deuterium, deuterium can can combine with another proton to produce helium-3. To produce helium-3, and there is no emission of positive charge on the, uh, or, or electron because it's already balanced, or the charge is already balanced, and you, you do emit a gamma ray. And then at, at this point, you have protons and deuteriums and helium-3. What happens next? Well, there are several branches. Okay, There are several branches. There are four branches, actually. Here are the two branches that I wrote down. One is this guy, the helium-3, can combine with yet another proton to produce helium-4. Helium-4 is stable, unlike helium-3. And then you can also have two helium-3s producing helium-4 plus two protons, and so on. See, you return two protons, just like you, what, what you had there. And each process is exothermic, which means they will release energy as a result. Okay, 
they do not absorb energy, release energy as a result. How are these numbers calculated? Very simple. It's just like the way we calculate the, uh, the, uh, the Q value for nuclear reaction. All we have to do is count all the risk masses, mass, 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 minus, actually, it's, it, you count the initial masses first, rest masses, rest masses, minus this, minus this, minus this. You get a, def you get a def deficiency in mass, right? So you lost a certain amount of mass. That mass turns into energy. That's the energy. Okay, you take that mass multiplied by C squared, you get this number. You can do that yourself. You can just, you know, make sure you check the, uh, uh, the numerical values of the rest mass of, of helium-3, helium-3, helium-4, proton, proton. Make sure you use a lot of sig figures. Do not just use the first three sig figures because the difference in mass is pretty small by percent. So if you use only three sig figures, they will cancel out. Okay, so if you keep a lot of sig figures, do a careful calculation, multiply by C squared, you're going to get this. And there are two other branches that I didn't write down. So that's the proton-proton cycle. The proton-proton cycle going on in the sun requires a temperature of about 15 million, de uh, 15 million Kelvin. Sounds like a very high temperature, but it's not re really terrible compared with other nuclear fusion events. It's relatively low temperature to, uh, to sustain such a uh, fusion event, and that is partly because the gravitational pull in, in the, at the center of the sun causes a very high density of, uh, of, of, of protons making the uh, protons very close together to, to begin with so that 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 makes it possible to to sustain fusion at a relatively low temperature 15 million kelvin okay now the combined effect of the proton proton cycle is you start with four protons and you end up with helium plus two positrons plus two electron neutrinos plus 26.7 mev that's when you combine all these effects together and uh, you can do this calculation to get 26.7 EV, MeV again by comparing the rest masses. Okay, now the initial rest mass of the four protons is roughly 4,000 MeV. Actually, it's a little bit less than that. A little bit less than that. Let's take a, take a just estimation 4,000 MeV. And you, this is the amount of energy that you get through this proton proton cycle. And so what fraction of the initial rest energy is converted into energy? Okay, in other words, what fraction of the mass of these four protons is actually lost and converted into energy as a result of this proton-proton uh, cycle? We well, can do a conversion ratio, 26.7 MeV divided by 4,000 MeV, you're getting 0.7%. That is a huge amount of mass loss or energy conversion. If you compare that with, uh, you know, a typical fusion case, uranium-235, remember how, what kind of percentage energy, uh, energy, uh, I mean, mass loss was that, or energy conversion. Remember, that was about 1 MeV per nucleon, right? And each nucleon has about 1,000 MeV, just like a proton or neutron. So the conversion ratio is about 0.1%, right? 1 thousandth, right? 1 1 thousandth. Here is 0.7%. So it's about seven times greater energy conversion. Rate. So seven times more energy per gram of fusion material compared with per gram of fission material. It's highly energetically efficient, 0.7% conversion. You compare that with a typical chemical reaction, that is about 1 10 millionth uh, of, 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 of uh, energy conversion from mass, which, which uh, we can ignore, you know, so the mass is essentially conserved. Here is a diagram for, uh, for this proton-proton uh, cycle, at least one branch. So it's in, it, it is an illustration of, uh, of, of this one branch, we start with two protons, okay? The red ones are protons, the gray ones are neutrons, and then the little ones are positrons. So two protons, they fuse together, producing an electron, a positron, and a, a neutrino, and then um, what, what they get is deuterium, okay? A proton plus a neutron, that's a deuterium. That deuterium combines with another proton from outside, they combine together, they produce two proton and one neutron combination. What is that? That is helium-3. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, something parallel happens over there. So another helium-3 is produced. And these two helium-3s combine to produce a helium-4, while at the same time returning two protons. So that is the proton-proton cycle that is described here. One, two, three. Okay. One, two, three. This particular branch is described here. Two helium threes, as you can see here. Two helium threes. So that's one example how that works. 
and there are other branches. Okay. Now, let's take a look at how we estimate the temperature needed for nuclear fusion. Take example, take the example of deuterium deuterium fusion. So you have two deuterium uh, nuclei getting close together. How close do they have to be in order to cause fusion? And based on that, can you figure out what kind of temperature of this deuterium soup that you must raise it to, to, to cause fusion to take place? If you do, here is the, uh, uh, the uh, interacting energy between two deuterium uh, nucleus, uh, nuclei and R being the center to center separation between them. This is uh, the potential well caused by the strong nuclear force, which is attractive, so it's a negative potential well. And this R0 is the range of nuclear force, which is about one Fermi. Okay, and outside that range, you don't have the nuclear force anymore. You only have the repulsive force between the, 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 the protons in each deuterium, so you have repulsive force. So that's a hump of potential well you have to overcome before you drop in. So imagine a deuterium, uh, a deuterium uh, nucleus coming in with this much kinetic energy, okay, and it slows down, slows down, slows down when it meets another deuterium particle because of the rep coolant repulsion. At this point, it turns back if it's a classical particle. If you do not consider tunneling, it just turns back here. So no reaction will take place. So if you do not consider tunneling, the energy must be at least this much, okay? The, in the in incoming kinetic energy has to at least this much so they can fall into the potential well. Uh, how much is that? Well, that depends what R0 is, right? So without quantum tunneling, you consider the kinetic energy has to be Ke e squared over R0, over R0. That's the kinetic en uh, the potential energy you have here. The kinetic energy becomes potential energy at this point, so you're just barely able to fall in. And let this equal to 3 over 2 kT. Why is that? Because that is the average kinetic energy of each particle at temperature T, classical physics. We can use classical physics here because the temperature is well, well, well high enough. So therefore, classical physics, classical statistics certainly works. We don't have to use quantum statistics at all. 3 over 2 kT is the perfect approximation. Okay, so you have R0 equals about 1 Fermi, you know. Why is that? Because K times E squared, remember what that is? That's 1.44 Fermi MeV, okay? That's a good combination to know. You divide it by R0, which is about 1 Fermi. The kinetic energy of each deuterium on average is about 1.44 MeV, okay, million electron volts. What temperature are we talking about here? Well, remember, at room temperature, which is 300 Kelvin, the average energy of each particle is 1 40th of MeV. Now, the average energy is 1.44 million EV. What is the corresponding temperature? So the ratio of T equals the ratio of uh, kinetic energy, right? Because, because it's proportional to T. So from here, using this, you don't have to convert this directly to energy yourself. You can use that ratio to do that. And the answer that you get is uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 10 Kelvin, 17 billion Kelvin instead of 15 million Kelvin at the center of the sun. So if you believe in this estimation, the, uh, the, uh, radio, uh, the uh, nuclear fission should not be going on in the sun because the temperature is about three orders of magnitude lower than expected. However, that is an overestimation for two reasons. One is, this is only the average, average kinetic energy. Even at this lower temperature, some of the particles will have energy considerably above that. Some will have energy below that. So at least part of the particles in, the, in this temperature can actually have enough energy to reach that. That's one thing. Another thing is that we have not discussed the effect of quantum tunneling here. In other words, the particle doesn't have to have this energy. As long as you have this much energy, it gets to this point and as long as this x distance is not too high, it can go over that hump by quantum tunneling and it can drop in. Okay, so let's do a more careful estimation based on the consideration of quantum tunneling. Now, when you reach here, what is the chance for you to get in there? Well, the chance becomes significant if this x is not too high. And that is, it's not too, too long, and that is, x is about the same as the penetration depth, right? Penetration depth, which we studied in chapter... Uh, 41, remember that? Chapter 41. The penetration depth is 
h bar over 2m times u0 over ke, u0 is the highest peak. So u0 o minus ke is just this much. That's the, that's the height of the barrier you have to tunnel through. It's about this much. Okay, so you don't have to get that close. You don't have to get that close. You only have to get this close, which means the center to center separation of between the two deuterium particles does not have to be R0. It has to be only R, which is R0 plus X. So it's a little bit wider, so you can you don't have to have this much energy. So R is about X, R0 plus X, which is roughly R0 plus delta, the penetration depth. And it turns out delta is considerably longer than R0, which is the wind Fermi. You can you can you can verify that after you get the value for, for, for delta later. Delta is roughly about 10 times as much as R0. So we can roughly ignore R0. So therefore, the kinetic energy can be recalculated. It's Ke squared over R, not Ke squared over R0. This is R. That is R0. OK? This is when the kinetic energy turns 100% into potential energy at this point. And what, 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 what happens next is you tunnel in and you fall. All right. So it is equal to not K squared over R0, but K squared over R0 plus delta. And delta is right here. And again, we can roughly ignore delta R0 because delta is about 10 times as much as we did here. Ten. OK, so, uh, so this, this side I'm going to write as Ke over, Ke squared over delta. Delta is right here. So we flip that over. This is a quadratic equation for Ke if you, if you take a close look. You have a Ke here, you have another Ke here, right? Now you, take, you square both sides, you get a quadratic equation for Ke, and you take the positive solution for Ke. OK. I have, uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you work out this uh, quadratic equation yourself, and you, you will find, after some easy calculation, you find that Ke is about 0.2 MeV instead of 1.44 MeV. Look at the difference here. And with that Ke, you plug in 1.2 MeV instead of 1. Point, you, you're going down by about one order of magnitude, and the corresponding temperature that you need for fusion, if you consider the quantum tunneling, is one order magnitude lower than that. Okay, it's about 10 to the 9. Okay, that's a billion Kelvin. This calculation is only by estimation. It's not very accurate, but if you do a more careful calculation, you will find that the actual temperature for nuclear fusion, deuterium, deuterium, is even a little bit lower than that. It's about 4 times 10 to the 8 Kelvin instead of 10 to the 9 Kelvin, but that's still pretty good. We're about half an order magnitude away. OK, that temperature is higher than the temperature at the center of the sun, because the center of the sun is pretty much the, is primarily the proton-proton cycle that's going on. But for, de for deuterium, you need pretty much this temperature. But in the sun, because of the high con higher concentration, the temperature uh, can be a little bit lower still to sustain chain reaction of, uh, of, uh, of the proton-proton cycle. So again, the key to nuclear fusion is high temperature. We're and we see we're looking at about 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 Kelvin instead of instead of reaching super criticality for fission. For fission, uh, if you want to build a bomb, you need to reach super crit criticality. And if you want to sustain chain reaction for a nuclear power plant, you just need, you have to just reach criticality just barely so that K equals 1, you can, the, the chain reaction can, can go on. It has nothing to do with temperature, okay, for, for fission. So the, uh, the, the uh, condition is different. So the question now is, how do you reach that kind of high temperature? In the sun, it's a natural environment because the nuclear uh, reaction is going on due to the, due to the gravitationally compressed uh, you know, region at the center of the sun causing a high temperature simply because of the huge gravitational compression. But how do you sustain that in an artificial environment on Earth? It's called terrestrial fusion instead of, instead of stellar fusion, which is going on inside the core of every star in the universe. Terrestrial nuclear fusion, how do you achieve that temperature? Well, there are two, two ways we can do that, depending on what kind of device we make out of it. Again, there is a military use, and there is a peaceful use. The military use is hydrogen bomb. In a hydrogen bomb, how do you create this kind of temperature? Turns out you do so by detonating a fission bomb first or atomic bomb so inside every hydrogen bomb there is a conventional fission or atomic bomb it detonates first creating the temperature needed for fusion to go on which increases the yield of the bomb significantly the second part is controlled nuclear fusion this is what we 
want to build for nuclear power plant, the, the new generation nuclear power plant that uses fusion instead of fission. This is much harder, as you can see here, because this temperature is hard enough to achieve, you know, without detonating a bomb. And then once we achieve the temperature, how do we keep it there? How do we control the process so that it doesn't go, doesn't go crazy? And how do we sustain this process? That is much harder, you can see. So the, the enemy, our enemy, is uh, the high temperature. All right, so let's look at both of these applications briefly. The first type is the hydrogen bomb, otherwise known as a thermal nuclear device. Thermal here means having to do with high temperature. Okay, this is the uh, typical design of a hydrogen bomb. It's called Tela Ulam design. And uh, it's invented by U.S. scientist Edward Teller. Um, the United States, as usual, was the first country to build something like this in 1952. That was after the Los Alamos project that built the uh, first atomic bombs in the, uh, toward the end of the Second World War. This is a few years later, 1952, and the, the USSR detonated their first hydrogen bomb in 1955, followed by the United Kingdom, China, and France. So these are the five declared nuclear powers they are also the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. The largest ever thermonuclear device, by thermonuclear I mean hydrogen bomb, ever detonated. It's called Zabamba. Zabamba. That was a Russian name, okay? It, it, is, it has a yield of 50 million tons of TNT. You compare that with the, with, with the first fission bomb ever dropped, 15, uh, 16 kilotons. This is 50 million tons. The largest fission bomb ever detonated by the U.S. military was half a million ton of TNT. Okay, the Ivy King, half a million tons. This is 50 million tons. This is a hundred times as bad as the worst fission bomb. This was detonated by the Russians in the year 1961. It's a three-stage bomb. This is what's called a two-stage bomb. We'll talk about this a little bit. The power of the Zab Bomba which lasted only a split second, was greater than 1% of the power output of the entire sun, not the Earth. Okay, the Earth is no match for that. Right? This is humongous. It was detonated by, uh, by dropping the bomb over the, over the, uh, over the barren land of Siberia by, uh, with an airplane. And uh, in, in fact, the Russians had enough technology to to build an even bigger one, over 100 megatons. But the problem was that if you design something that big, you dropped it by, by a pallet, uh, the bomb would, 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 would produce, uh, would, would produce an, uh, you know, a radiation and a fireball so fast that the pilot of the airplane will not be able to fly fast enough to escape from the bomb that he dropped. So they, have to, had, to, they had to downgrade it to 50 megatons, which is still the world record holder. So, what is the physics behind the Talaoma design of hydrogen bomb? Again, you have to create enough temperature, we're talking about 10 to the 7 Kelvin, at least, to produce nuclear reaction, uh, nuclear fusion. So here is, there, is, there are two stages, primary and secondary. The primary one is actually a fission bomb, just a conventional atomic bomb, fission bomb. The fission bomb explodes, creating the enormous pressure. The pressure exerts on this casing, which is called a temper pusher, temper pusher. What do we call it? The pusher because it pushes it in. Okay, push it in. We're talking about everything happens in, in a matter of split second. We're talking about uh, less than one microsecond, less than one microsecond. So what happens within that less than one microsecond? This guy detonates first, creating an enormous pressure to push it in. This red area is fusion material. Okay, is the fusion material tritium and deuterium and lithium. And uh, there is also a core. There is also a fission core at the center made of mostly plutonium. So this enormous compression, a shock wave, compresses this entire area to only about one-tenth uh, to, to only about one-tenth one or, or even about two, uh, three to 5% of the original volume. So there is a huge amount of compression ratio of 20 to 30 times. 
So it's much, much smaller than before. And all this compression comes from that nation of, of, of this uh, fission bomb. And also the in enormous temperature created by the, by the fission will then cause fusion to take place. And this rod in the middle, the fission also helps to produce, it also detonates after this. So it also helps to create this enormous temperature. So then, f then, then, then fission, a fusion will take place. It, this thing again is called a pusher and temper. It's called a pusher because of the reason that I just explained. Also called temper because the neutrons that are emitted in, a, in, 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 the, in the reaction got trapped here and part, partially get reflected, which will cause more fusion event. So this is, a, this is the basic design. It's a, it's a two-stage design because primary, secondary, the Russian bomb that made that uh, that made the world record was a three-stage bomb. So here's the second stage. The second stage then ignites the third stage, which is an even bigger fusion bomb. So that's how they were able to do something like this. Today, uh, there are there are several other nuclear powers uh, apart from these five countries, but uh, uh, it appears that uh, countries with with mature technology for for thermonuclear bomb, that is hydrogen bomb, they're only limited, still limited to these five countries. North Korea, for example, is believed to only have a, a rudimentary fission bomb instead of a fusion one, which is much, much more powerful. Um, and uh, the, the, the U.S., along with s s several countries like, uh, like, like Russia, has modernized its design of nuclear thermonuclear warheads. This is, the, this is the only the original design. They have modified designs so they can fit a much smaller, f fit a power bomb, powerful bomb into a much smaller package. We're talking about warhead the size of, uh, of a small table that can destroy a city. So this is very destructive use of energy. So basically we're mimicking what's going on inside the sun for this very brief second. Okay, now the second type of application of nuclear fusion is the peaceful application type and that is controlled nuclear fusion. This is still being researched. It is not a mature industry technology, but we're hopeful that in the near future this will become the uh, nuclear power plant that replaces the current fission type. And uh, what's the physics behind it? Let's see. Well, first of all, there are many, many different types of fusion events that we, we can think of. You know, it basically takes smaller ones like, uh, you know, uh, hydrogen and deuterium and so on, and just fuse them together, right? These three are the more promising ones, especially the last one. This one's got a DD, this called DT. DD means deuterium, deuterium, DT means deuterium, tritium. Tritium is another radioactive isotope of hydrogen. It's got two neutrons and one proton. Deuterium has one neutron, one proton, as you know. So this is DD, uh, as we already saw before, it can release four MeV of energy but DT is actually better. Deuterium and tritium, it can release 17.6 MeV. And a another thing is that it requires lower temperature than that. Now, we estimated this, right? We estimated this. But this is even lower, so it's easier to, to, to maintain. And why, why is the temperature required a little bit lower? There is a good reason, because this guy is a little bit bigger, okay, than deuterium. So, so because itself is a little bit bigger, it, the nuclear energy reach, uh, the nuclear uh, force can reach a little bit bigger size region, and therefore you don't have to get that, this guy don't have to get that close to him in order to initiate nuclear fusion. So the temperature required is a little bit lower, which is an added bonus. So this is the uh, primary um, reaction that's been studied today for, as candidate for commercial nuclear fusion power plants. The key physics behind controlled nuclear fusion is the so-called Lawson's criterion. Lawson was a British physicist, and he derived this Lawson's criterion, which says the product of these two physical quantities must exceed a certain value for these cycles, for these for these reactions to 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 go on. DD cycle requires n times tau to be greater than this. DT cycle, uh, you know, you have that. What is n? What is tau? N is the number density of these fusion particles, deuterium, tritium, and so on, n. And tau is the time interval that you can maintain such high temperature. 
Okay, so basically, in order to sustain nuclear fusion, what you need to do is you have to compress a whole bunch of them together, and you have to com combine them in a, in, at a such a high temperature for enough time. Okay, that is the Lawson criterion. How is the Lawson criterion derived? Well, the basic physics is quite simple. The calculation of these numbers, that's totally another story which we will not touch here. It's much more complicated. But the basic physics is quite simple. The Lawson criter criterion basically is the criterion that, that says that if this is satisfied, then I can put less energy in to initiate nuclear fusion, and the out output energy due to fusion is actually greater than the amount of energy that I put in, so I win. You know, the overall, I gain energy that way. So how much energy does it take to, to, to raise the temperature of this substance? Well, per unit volume, how many particles are there? M, right? And, uh, you know, on average, they, they reach a certain amount of energy, one, a 3 half kT. So therefore, the amount of energy that you need to bring the temper temperature of this substance to such a high value per unit volume would be a constant times the number of particles in that box, right? So that's uh, the energy you have to put in. You can use laser, you can use other means to raise that temperature. But what kind of energy is generated from nuclear fusion? Well, nuclear fusion takes place when these two particles collide with each other. So it's not just n, it's n squared, because you have to get them close enough. You have two particles, the chance of two particles meeting each other is proportional to n squared, not n. Okay? And also, you have to bring them close enough for enough time so that you can allow time for this one to fuse together. It all depends on tau, the time it for the time for them to uh, uh, to be to be that close at that temperature, so therefore, e, if you want e generated energy in order to be greater than the energy you put in, so this is greater than that, so therefore, n two n c two n squared tau must be greater than c one times n. You cross out one power of n, you get this. C one over c two is a constant. That constant equals this for for deuterium transition, and equal to that for deuterium deuterium. That is the Lawson criterion. Have we reached the loss of criterion? The answer is yes, in research facilities, not in commercial power plants. We have not built any controlled nuclear fusion-based commercial power plants. But in research facilities, we have long achieved and exceeded the loss of criterion. The big question here is how do I put such a hot fireball at this kind of temperature uh, into a f confined region for a long enough time. How do you achieve confinement? This thing is so hot that you cannot put it in a box, right? In, in a container, because containers long melted before that, right? We're talking about, you know, uh, millions of, of, of degrees of temperature. So how do you do that? Well, it turns out there are two major ways to do that for confinement momentarily. One is magnetic confinement, and the other is inertial confinement. The uh, magnetic confinement uses the uh, the idea that at this temperature, you have you don't have solid, liquid, or even a gas. What you have is just a bunch of po positive charged particles, and a bunch of negative charged particles. It's called a plasma, okay? And the plasma can their charged particles moving very very fast. Okay, listen, charged particles moving at high speed. What does that tell us? Magnetic force. They respond strongly to magnetic force. Lorentz force. Q, v cross b. You have a large v. Okay, if you have, you have a Q charge, you have large V, and you give it a large magnetic field, they will respond to you. So we use magnetic force to combine these charges, to alter their motion, to let them move in circles. So that is called magnetic confinement. So they build large-scale devices to produce huge magnetic fields in, in, in the shape of a toroid. And that machine is called a tokamak machine. They have tokamak machines in, in, in several parts of the world, large-scale tokamak machines, one in Princeton, uh, one in Tokyo, and so on. The other type is inertial confinement, and that is you take a small sphere of this uh, of this fuel mixture, a small sphere, and uh, if you don't do anything, they're going to drop by gravity. They're going to drop. But if you can do something within a very short split second, then they don't have a chance to drop yet. They're still there because delta T is so short, they cannot move very far. It's called inertial confinement. So you have to do something, though. You have to do something very quickly. We're talking about uh, less than one billionth of a second. You have to do something. What do you do? Well, you inject enough energy to it to cause fusion. And we typically use laser. We, we shine laser at 
we shine laser at this ball of fuel, small ball of fuel, like one gram, from all directions, powerful lasers to do that. So it has a short tail, but very large end. Why, why very large end? Because the laser can produce so much energy to, to compress this ball to a very small size, so end can be very large. So literally, it is the optical pressure of the laser that causes an implosion of this small ball of, uh, of, of, uh, of fusion fuel to cause it to, 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 to go into fusion. That's inertial confinement. And uh, there are a few large-scale inertial conf confinement uh, research facilities in the world as well, including the National Ignition Facility in the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. All right. So we talked about the basic physics behind controlled fusion, and uh, you can see here the most promising type of, uh, of uh, fusion we use in involves deuterium and tritium. Do we have enough deuterium and tritium available as fuel? That is the next question we want to address. Let's see here. Deuterium is not a problem at all. Deuterium can be extracted from the water in the ocean. And we have a limited, virtually unlimited supply of deuterium. We're talking about billions of years. Uh, we have deuterium available. That's not a problem. Tritium is trickier. Tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, and it's not very stable. It has a, it, it's, it's got a half-life of about 12 years only, which means when they are produced in the atmosphere by cosmic rays, uh, they're going to die pretty soon. So because of the short half-life, you cannot mine it in large quantity naturally in the natural environment, unlike you know, uh, uranium, which has even U-235 has 700 million years of half-life. You can actually get it from, from nature by mining. Tritium, you cannot. So how do you get tritium? It turns out there is an easy way to do that. You can manufacture your own. You can breed them. Okay, you can breed them. So it can be bred as a byproduct of the power plant. The power plant during the nuclear fusion produces fast moving neutrons. And these neutrons, when you use these neutrons to bombard lithium-6, which is an iso radioactive isotope of, of, of lithium, you will get tritium plus other particles, plus an extra amount of energy indeed. Now, lithium-3, lithium-6, I'm sorry, is is an isotope that's a little radioactive, so it's not the most abundant. It's only about 7.4% in nature. But there's, there's a lot of lithium in nature. And you can even use the regular, the more abundant lithium-7, if you have a fast neutron. This is a slow neutron can cause six lithium-6 to, to produce tritium. But fast neutrons can even cause the more abundant lithium-7 lithium to do the same thing. And they can produce a slow neutron in, in the process. So we have lithium. Either seven or six can be used to produce the tritium that we need. And lithium is relatively abundant in nature. In fact, we can also extract lithium from the ocean. There, it will have enough lithium to support nuclear fusion on this D, to D plus T scheme for the next 207 million years. So that's a long, long, long time. And if you can do that, overcome all technical difficulties, it turns out that there's enough energy in one liter of seawater you, you extract its deuterium out, and you, you add half a gram of lithium, which is used to produce tritium, okay, one liter of seawater. You turn it into energy through nuclear fusion, you will get 1,000 liters worth of gasoline. Okay, 1,000 liters worth of gasoline. So here's a flow diagram for the proposed DT fusion reactor using the physics that we just described a minute ago. Again, this is the reaction. Deuterium tritium equals uh, alpha particle plus a neutron plus about 17.6 MeV. This is a 0.38 mass to energy conversion ratio. If you did all the uh, if you did all the uh, uh, um, numbers, okay, final energy, uh, final, you know, the, the mass deficiency you will get about 0.38%. That is much better than 0.1% for fission. So here is the, uh, the uh, flow diagram. You have deuterium coming in, and you have lithium coming in. I would, would talk about, uh, you have tritium coming in. We'll talk a little bit where the tritium comes from. 
So you mix them together, okay? Mix them together, you inject into the core, which is a, this is a very small region, lo very small region. Okay, so uh, you have to feed energy into it, you know, through laser or whatever. You have to feed energy into it, and that energy raise the temperature of this pellet, this fuel pellet, to uh, 10 to the 7 Kelvin. Okay, 4.5, 10 to the 7 Kelvin, which ignites fusion. Fusion then produces not only heat, but also produces, uh, not only, well, it actually produces uh, these two particles, fast-moving particles, helium and uh, neutrons. So helium neutrons, we'll, we'll, we'll just go this way. Actually, the helium will not go very far because the helium is, char is, is, a, is a charged particle, okay? And uh, they, they, they retain in the plasma, because, but that they carry a lot of energy. They carry about... They carry about 20% of kinetic energy. This guy carries about 80% of energy. Why? Because conservation momentum required, they have the same momentum, but this guy has a lot less mass than that, right? The energy is P squared over 2M, kinetic energy. This M is about uh, one quarter of that M. So this guy will, will carry about four times as much energy away than that one. So this is about 80%, this is about 20%. You see that? Four to one ratio. Okay, so 20% of the energy is retained in as a, as a kinetic energy of, of, of the alpha particle, and they remain here in the plasma to raise the plasma temperature even higher, which is good. The rest of the energy is carried by this, 80% energy is carried by these fast-moving neutrons, fast neutrons. And these neutrons are very useful, okay? They're the byproduct of, radio, of, of this uh, reaction, but with, we need them because these neutrons will then enter this region, this orange region, which is, which is filled with liquid lithium liquid lithium the lithium then getting bombarded by these uh, neutrons will produce the tritium which is the, uh, the you know which is what you need for nuclear reaction for nuclear fusion so this lithium acts as double duty first of all it produces it breathes tri tritium which is the fuel needed and secondly it carries the energy away. These fast neutrons carry a lot of kinetic energy, so they will heat up this thing. Okay, it's the temperature is much gets it gets raised to really high value, and then so this is a very hot lava of uh, of uh, of lithium, and this hot lava goes through here. This is a cycle, and then it exchanges heat with this uh, with, uh, with, uh, with with water outside, and that turns the water into steam. Steam then dr drive the turbine to produce electrical energy. Meanwhile, the lithium gets a little bit cooler here, uh, and you you have basically lithium and tritium. Tritium is produced here, right, through this reaction, right? And then you separate the lithium and tritium. Lithium returns here. Tritium goes here, which again mixes with deuterium, and the cycle begins again. So this is how the basic flow diagram is. And you can see again here that tritium is actually bred by itself. So part of the fuel is self bread it's not input from outside this is a very clever design all right now last I would, I'm going to talk about a little bit about safety of fusion based power plants we know fusion clearly has uh, has uh, advantage over fission power plants because uh, the uh, fuel used is very abundant in nature right and it does not cause that kind of pollution uh, the, you know the f there is no such thing as f spent fuel rods that stays radioactive for decades or, or, or longer. Here we're talking about uh, no risk of meltdown or explosion. No risk. Why is that? Take a look. To sustain fusion, you need a very high temperature. This is extremely difficult to do. Anything that you don't do well, such as you do not put enough power from laser or electrical current, you're not going to reach that temperature. When you don't reach that temperature, no fusion is going on. So the, the whole thing just shut down by itself. Okay? Unlike fission, which is more or less a spontaneous process if you give enough neutrons. Unless you control these neutrons, it's going to go on and go on, go on by itself. You cannot just easily shut it down. Here, as long as you do not input any power to, to sustain the temperature, it shuts down by itself. So there is no meltdown problem. There is no explosion. And what about the byproduct? Well, again, with fission, uh, the uranium or plutonium splits into intermediate-sized nuclei. They themselves are radioactive and often are long-lived radioactive isotopes. They can pollute the air, the environment, the water for a long time to come. But here, what do you have? You have neutrons. You have some, uh, and, and, and you have some tritium. Tritiums are 
weakly radioactive. They are radioactive, but they're not terrible at all. We use them all, you know, in a lot of places. And the tritium are only produced as we go, and this tritium is immediately being used again. So you do not store a large amount of tritium everywhere. It's a very small amount. They're produced and being used immediately, produced and being used immediately in a cycle. So it's much better than you know, the radioactive waste of a fission power plant. And uh, um, neutrons, even if the neutrons leak out, the worst thing can happen, they can die into, uh, become ele uh, electrons and, and, and protons, and that can happen uh, in a few minutes because the average half-life, the half-life is only 930 seconds, so that's, that's a short half-life. It's not bad at all. It's not going to cause any long-term pollution. And as such, it is not an attractive target for to, to terrorists because even, even if they manage to, to blow that thing up, it's not going to cause large-scale environmental disaster. So the terrorists are less attracted to that target, so that makes it safer. So there are all kinds of reasons to, for us to uh, increase our effort on the research of building nuclear power plants, the next generation, the fusion-based power plants.